My presentation today was uh, on the topic of um, intracerebral uh, gene therapy for mucopolysaccharidosis type 1 or M MPS1. Um, MPS1 is a uh, neurologic uh, progressive disorder. Um, it's an enzyme deficiency and because the body isn't producing uh, enough enzyme in all of its cells, um, there's buildup of storage. Uh, we call it glycosaminoglycans or GAGs. They're basically like little sugar molecules um, that have um, other purposes that more support uh, for connective tissues. Um, and our body typically needs to recycle um, these uh, GAGs. And so the, the enzyme that's missing in MPS type 1 helps to recycle uh, a couple of specific GAGs uh, that build up or that are found in the brain uh, and the rest of the body. And so when you're missing this enzyme, it's called IDUA or igeronidase. Um, the GAGs don't get broken down. They build up uh, within brain cells and you know, cells of the the joints and the liver, the spleen, other, you know, pretty much all the organs of the body. Currently, there's a couple of treatments um, for MPS type 1. Uh, one is intravenous enzyme replacement therapy, and so that's um, putting the missing enzyme back into the body uh, intravenously once a week. Um, that doesn't treat the neurologic aspect of the disease because the enzyme does not cross uh, the blood-brain barrier it doesn't go from your circulation into the brain. So the other treatment, uh, especially for the severe neurologic form of MPS1, is um, a bone marrow transplant or a hematopoietic stem cell transplant. Um, and the idea of that is to take a donor stem cells, um, infuse them into the child's body, and most of them find their way into the bone marrow where they're supposed to be, some of them also become the immune system inside the brain. And it's those cells that go into the brain that make a little bit of enzyme that help to sort of rescue uh, the cells that surround uh, the neurons, the neurons themselves, they uh, make a little bit of enzyme which can help to reduce some of the storage. Transplant is a big deal. Um, you need to give chemotherapy uh, before you give the infusion to try and like remove the child's existing immune system so that's not without risk um, once you've infused the uh, stem cells it takes about two to three weeks best case scenario for the stem cells to take and for like them to start making red blood cells and white blood cells and platelets and during that time you're at risk for infections and various things. And then um, there's something called graft versus host disease where the uh, transplanted um, blood cells may actually attack the child's body because the, the immune match may not be complete and it looks around and the immune system looks at the, the cells of the child's body and says, nope, I don't recognize you, so I'm going to attack you. So the idea of gene therapy, um, especially for uh, what we talked about, was to um, package the uh, igeronidase gene into a little delivery vehicle called a vector, um, and then inject it into um, the central nervous system. Uh, so it goes into the back of the, um, the neck. Uh, there's a special CT machine or computerized tomography machine that guides our interventional radiologist so he knows exactly where he needs to go. Um, you obviously don't want to touch the spinal cord with the needle and so there's a little space of fluid that he's aiming for. Um, and that's what interventional radiologists do. That's their job, is to get to difficult to reach areas. So once you've uh, reached that little area, you slowly inject um, the gene therapy. It's a clear liquid. Um, it then gets kind of distributed throughout the spinal fluid and delivers to various parts of the brain. And the idea is to equip now 
the brain cells with the ability to make their own enzyme. So that was the idea. What we talked about today were actually the results. And so um, a total of uh, nine uh, patients or children with severe MPS1 have been treated. Uh, I think the study's been going on for a couple of years now. Um, we also included one of uh, my patients who was the first in the world to be treated. Um, he kind of paved the way for all these other children. Um, and for some reason or another, uh, all the children in this uh, study either um, had a stem cell transplant that didn't really completely take, or uh, most of the children in the study had actually never received a stem cell transplant ever. And um, I think many of the families were worried about sort of the potential, you know, adverse effects of a stem cell transplant and thought, well, okay, let's see if we can do this gene therapy and if it works, then maybe we can avoid having to do a stem cell transplant. Um, if it doesn't, then, you know, we can always have something to fall back on. Um, some of the children have been followed up for probably about a year and a half or so. Um, and essentially the various different uh, data that are collected include safety, so is what we're doing safe for these children? Um, some of it is what we call efficacy, so is it working, right? So um, are, can you find the enzyme being made in the brain? So we, uh, every six months, do a, a lumbar puncture. Um, you get spinal fluid out from the back, and then you can actually measure the spinal fluid to see if there's any uh, enzyme in there because there wasn't before. You can see how much um, gag substrate is, the, is in the spinal fluid and if you've reduced it then you've shown that you know your treatment is working. Um, I think most importantly though you want to know if it's helping the children's development right? because without therapy um, children with uh, severe MPS1 they they're, they're already kind of developmentally delayed in their first year of life, and then they slow really quickly with the pace that they acquire milestones. And then after a certain age, I think it's around two or three, they actually start losing milestones, right? Kids are supposed to like gain and gain and gain and progress, and um, kids with MPS1 uh, um, lose their milestones until completely, potentially you've lost all your milestones which is what makes it such a nasty condition, one that really, you know, begs for some kind of treatment. Um, so I think we are able to collect uh, or, or analyze uh, data from five of these uh, nine patients. Uh, the other four, they were recently treated, like within the last six months. And so it's too early to say, or there's not enough data to really conclude um, but it looks good. Um, so uh, I believe four out of the five patients um, are, you can measure enzyme in the spinal fluid. Um, whenever you're measuring the gag levels uh, in the spinal fluid and within the bloodstream, so it's not just upstairs in the brain, but it's also in the, in the circulation, um, the gag levels are reduced pretty significantly. Um, it's not completely normalized, but it's down probably about 80% of the way. And uh, any kind of reduction makes a huge difference. Um, and developmentally, um, I think almost all of the kids are within normal range. Right? So there's something called a natural history study where you take children without treatment, and this is long before there was any kind of treatment. It's not like you deliberately <laughs> don't treat kids. These are children from a long time ago and you kind of plot out how their development goes and you compare it to how the treated kids go. Um, and it's actually really exciting because um, most of the children, uh, they, actually all the children who began within normal range for development, they're still within normal range for development far beyond the age that you'd expect them to have started losing milestones, right? So these are non-transplanted kids 
who got the gene therapy who are still developmentally normal. Granted, it's still pretty early, but it's about a year and a half, two years out that we would have expected them to have lost skills by now. and They're still moving forward. The one child that um, is below normal started off below normal, so he or she was already a little bit behind uh, the get-go. Um, but that child is also progressing in their developmental milestones as well. Um, there, was, uh, there is one child who is older. Um, she's a teenager. She had a stem cell transplant that um, essentially started to peter out as she got older. And so um, we were able to treat her. The developmental testing is a little bit different for a teenager, but we're seeing like gains um, in her developmental milestones that are far beyond, you know, in 12 months, you're only supposed to gain 12 months worth of developmental milestones. And for some of them, she's gained years within like 12, you know, to 18 months of follow-up. So it's pretty darn exciting. Um, last thing I wanna mention is um, safety, right? So are we doing any harm? And um, it appears that, you know, uh, there's no adverse effects from the injection. There's no adverse effects from the gene therapy itself. Um, we do put our children on some immunosuppressive medications for, you know, there are various different medicines that get uh, slowly tapered out throughout an entire year. Um, and the idea for that is you don't want the body to reject the gene therapy that you're giving. And you aim for some like target levels that are actually fairly low uh, compared to say what a stem cell transplant gets. They're really high. Um, there were some like adverse effects like low white blood count and various things that resolved pretty quickly. Um, there was an ear infection um, and one of my patients first got COVID and then got uh, bronchiolitis afterwards. Um, I don't think his issues were related to the immunosuppression, uh, but I think we want to be like overly conservative and careful, and so we just said, well, there's a possibility it might be related to the immunosuppressive medicines, but I really don't think so. So, by and large, I think you know both the gene therapy and the immune suppression afterwards are pretty safe and well tolerated.